Is this one? Yeah, this is perfect. Okay, well, I was asked to come here and speak about entrepreneurship and economic downturns, but that's not really what I want to talk about. So I'm going to talk about that for two slides, and then I'm going to talk about kind of entrepreneurship uh, more broadly. And uh, one of the main reasons is, um, some of you may have seen this, but uh, the Kauffman Foundation recently came out with a paper that uh, discussed exactly this, entrepreneurship and it's what happens to it during an economic downturn. And what we found was that uh, recessions and bear markets, uh, while they seem painful, don't appear to actually have a negative impact on the formation or survival of new businesses. So to frame that a little bit, um, I'm going to talk very little about uh, all of entrepreneurship, and I'm going to talk about a specific part of entrepreneurship that I hope for this crowd is a little more relevant, which is the, the actual startup process. So uh, there are entrepreneurs who are running very large companies who are in this room today who I think all of the people who want to be doing that someday should probably make a, a, a real effort to meet them today. But I'm going to talk about the very beginning part of the process mostly and um, what's, what's happening and what it takes to take an idea and really turn it into a company uh, today. So one of the reasons that we think it doesn't matter is that it turns out that over half of the companies in the Fortune 500 today and, and almost half of the companies, the Inc. 5000 list, which are actually the fastest growing companies in the world, were founded during an economic downturn or recession. And that's only been about 20% of the time, actually, that these companies have been measured. So in less than 20% of the time, half of the companies have been founded. And it leads you to ask a lot of questions about why that is. But um, at, at the end of the day, there is, there's a lot of different kinds of entrepreneurship, and there's a lot of different kinds of entrepreneurs. But the process of starting up is driven sometimes by passion and energy, and it is driven sometimes by necessity. People who have been laid off, they need to create a job, and that kind of entrepreneurship can actually be a very powerful catalyst for, for the birth of new companies. Um, and I'm going to show actually a chart on this one, but one of the things as it relates beyond just startup companies, but, but to actual job creation, is that uh, if you compare job creation from startups across all of time to actual job loss and creation in the whole economy, what we found is that it's actually much less volatile than big companies. And, and it actually, in this chart here, I think we'll show it. That relatively flat line in the middle is the, is the job creation of startup companies. So that's companies less than five years old. And that really jagged line is actually what's been going on in the broader economy. And if you see those, I hope you can see those light gray slices that go all the way up and down the chart. Those were actually times of economic downturn and recessions. And so what you see is while there's a little bit of volatility, startups actually end up being, um, strangely enough, a safer place for the economy to be. And, and when you're talking about uh, certainly an, an economy that is a wealthy economy, an economy like Singapore's economy, I think it's uh, slightly more pronounced even that the possibilities that lie in new job creation when you're already in a relatively stable economy really lie in startups. So um, that's really all I'm going to talk about, about downturns, because at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. It does not matter to the entrepreneurs who are out there. Um, it actually affects large companies so much more, it, for, for obvious reasons, but um, to give a quick anecdote on this for my personal life, I'd, I work very closely with two startups right now, and uh, what we found was the last year and a half were amazing for us, exactly because our clients are the big companies who are trying to figure out how to cut costs as they're eliminating groups, as they're trying to figure out how to get more out of their R&D budget. They're actually turning to startups for help. And so for people who are here who are in the business of finding those clients and figuring out how to grow your company, you have a huge, huge advantage if you're, if you're in the birthing part of the, of the company as opposed to running a multi-billion dollar company, for example. So um, I quite like this chart, actually, because it looks kind of funny, but actually it's backed by some academic papers that are really interesting. And it, it talks about the kind of history over a very long period of time with entrepreneurship. And Marx, Schumpeter, kind of very famous economists, came out with papers and big theories and books around the death of entrepreneurship starting in the mid-1800s, going all the way up to about 50 years ago when I, I think so much change was happening definitely in this country. And they basically predicted the end of entrepreneurship. They said it doesn't make sense. Economies of scale will always dominate. You're going to end up with a few huge monopolies that kind of run the entire world. And it kind of looked like they were right, actually, until um, the tech revolution happened in the early 80s, late 70s. And all of a sudden, there was a massive rebound in what is measured here as entrepreneurs per workforce. 
And, and actually, you know, everyone is still debating what the upslope of that scale on the other side looks like, but it completely changed the accessibility of entrepreneurship, the efficiency of entrepreneurship, what it takes to start a company both financially, um, human capital, all of the things that it takes to really bring a company together in its early stages, really, really changed. And, and being, being here, um, it, it's a great example of how kind of investment in technology can be leveraged to really fuel a new crop of entrepreneurs. So I think if you walk around the booths out here and you see the companies, there's uh, even the companies that don't look like technology companies, they rely on technology for, for supply chain management, for, for outsourced manufacturing. These are things that were impossible until, until the kind of turn uh, in the early 80s that allowed this to be so accessible. So I'm gonna show a bunch of really weird charts here, and they actually have a point, but um, th this chart right here, it talks about the different kind of companies that exist today, and while it is certainly not an inclusive list, what it's really about is uh, how much funding is required to start a company and how that's really changed over time. And I think when you talk about something like an economic downturn, people get really, uh, eager to talk about things like how you're gonna raise venture capital, um, where you're gonna get money, equity financing or debt financing to get your company going. But what's happened even over the last 10 years is a lot of those companies that used to need that kind of financing that are on the far left side of this chart, web-based companies, software as a service companies, service companies, are, uh, they, they, need, they need so little money today that what they really need is one entrepreneur or two entrepreneurs who are willing to kind of go out there and really try to build something. And, and that is something that uh, would have been very difficult to do in the 80s, even the mid 90s. And um, a lot of those companies in the middle category, software companies circa 1990, hardware companies, they're still being built today, but even they're becoming cheaper and easier to build. And then you've got these, um, and, and I think Singapore is actually in a really interesting position because then you've got the biotech, clean tech infrastructure companies that have a much longer term horizon and need huge amounts of money. And there are actually very few places in the world where you actually can see a path for how those companies are gonna become real. And this is definitely one of them. I mean, I think the advantages inherent in being here trying to build a company like that are, are huge. So I'm gonna just overlay something onto this to say, the number of companies in these categories is what's really interesting. The number of companies that are starting as a software as a service business model or, or a service company that's offering consulting is, is exploded. There are, there are literally millions of companies doing things like launching iPhone apps and building web-based companies. And the reason is because it's so cheap to do. And so it, the, the interesting thing about it is it doesn't need a lot of external support. It doesn't need a lot of it doesn't need a lot of government support, it doesn't need a lot of venture capital support. These companies are almost becoming practice companies for people because any three of us in this room could get together today and come up with an idea and by the end of next week have a prototype of a product out there and available. And so where that becomes really interesting is, is less in where the next crop of big companies are gonna come from or billion dollar companies, but it becomes really interesting when you think about that as an educational tool. Uh, someone mentioned earlier that uh, there are actually real, uh, Anthony mentioned earlier that they're actually uh, moving from business plans in schools to actually taking the next step to turn those into real companies. And companies that exist in this area that need so little capital, they need energy, they need time, and they need a lot of passion, th those are companies that you can start as a 14-year-old, as an 18-year-old, as a 60-year-old, it doesn't really matter. And so entrepreneurship as a, as a choice has become so much more accessible that you just have to kind of get the right inspiration to actually make that choice.